בעצם לומדים בערך 4,000 סטודנטים, קצת פחות למעשה, אבל קרוב ל-4,000 סטודנטים. לומדים סטודנטים במחלקות שונות, מחלקה למתמטיקה שימושית, למדעי המחשב, להונדסה, לטכנולוגיות למידה, לניהול טכנולוגיה, לדיזיין כמובן, לעיצוב שזה ידוע. אז בקיצור, במגוון רחב של תחומים. במחלקה שלנו יש לנו 11 חברי סגל, אנחנו כולנו פעילים במחקר. למשל בשנה האחרונה פורסמו כ-20 מאמרים מהמחלקה בכתבי עת ובכנסים בינלאומיים. אז אנחנו בתחומים שונים של, של מתמטיקה שימושית. זהו, אז אנחנו יש לנו תואר ראשון במתמטיקה שימושית ואנחנו עובדים לפתוח תואר שני משותף למתמטיקה שימושית ומדעי המחשב. אז זה ככה בעצם נותן לכם ראייה כללית על דברים שנעשים במכון ו... ב, 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 יותר, בצורה יותר ספציפית במחלקה שלנו. עכשיו אנחנו נשמע להרצאה הראשונה, היות ואני רוצה גם לספר שתי מילים עליך, ברשותך. אוקיי, okay, אז uh, פרופסור קופמן מייל יוניברסיטי, אז, uh, אז קודם כל הוא חוקר uh, מאוד, uh, מאוד ידוע בתחום מה שנקרא I Dimensional Data and Harmonic Analyses, אז uh, בקיצור ל, לסטודנטים שעוד לא בעצם uh, אולי יודעים בדיוק מה, מה אומרים הדברים האלה, אז זה בא בעצם, נגיד, high dimensional data, זה, זה, זה בעצם התחום של לנתח נתונים שהם במרחבים עם מימד מאוד מאוד גבוה, ויש לזה כל מיני בעיות אלגוריתמיות ומתמטיות, וזה ממש על קסי המזלג העניין, והרמוניק אנליזי זה קשור לעיבוד אותות ו, ו, ודברים כאלה. אוקיי, okay, אז uh, פרופסור קופמן הוא עתיר פר, פרסים למעשה, הוא קיבל, הוא חבר ב-American Academy of Arts and Science ו-The Connecticut Academy of Science and Engineering and also in the National Academy of Science. ב-1996 הוא קיבל uh, בעצם פרס דחפה, דחפה זה ארגון מאוד מאוד, uh, מאוד מוביל בארצות הברית ב- במה שקשור הייתי אומר במדע היישומי, הייתי מגדיר את זה בצורה כללית כזאת, אבל זה ארגון מאוד חשוב בארצות הברית, הוא קיבל The Connecticut Science Medal וב-99 הוא קיבל The Pioneer Award of International Society for Industrial and Applied Science וגם The National Medal of Science, אוקיי? אז הוא ייתן לנו הרצאה לגבי uh, learning dual conceptual uh, geometry to achieve signal processes of data bases. What I'd like to do now is basically uh, sort of give you an overview of how you can take data which is completely unstructured that you don't know very much about and try to get it organized in such a way that you actually can take a, an Excel sheet that somebody gives you and organize it as an image uh, in a way that we'll, I'll describe in a minute. But let me start with a simple uh, sort of thought experiment. So let's say you have this matrix here. So I want to think of data as initially as a matrix where every column is an observation and every row is a measurement, uh, what is a measurement of that observation. So here uh, I have a simple matrix and which was pretty well organized and I take this metric matrix and I do something very simple I just shuffle the columns and shuffle the rows so in other words I order the columns in the way that they came to me which is arbitrary and order the rows in such in a, in a way like this I get some some things that look like that so the first question that one can ask is is there a way of uh, unraveling this and getting back to the original matrix or something which is as structured as the original matrix. And I, I'm going to show you this in some sense is a universal problem. And uh, we'll see many, many examples uh, for images and so on. So uh, here is a, another, a more, more elaborate example of that. So uh, think of uh, this function that you have up on top, which is a function taking values between 0 and 1. And think of it as each pixel has a number between 0 and 1. Think of that number as a probability of a coin toss. And you, you toss a coin, and 
uh, with, that, with that probability, you either get a 0 or 1. Okay? So if you were to do that, uh, you'll, get, you'll get the same picture, if you wish, but it will be dithered. Right? This is what you do when you have an image. You want to send a fax version of it. Right? You put a black dot or a white dot by basically <coughs> uh, pulling it out of, out of a probability. So you toss a coin, and now you have black and whites, and it gives you the gray level like that. Right? So, that's, so normally, this is what would happen if you dither that image. But now, suppose you dither it, and then you, you scramble the columns and the rows. You'll get something that looks like this garbage. And the real question, what I'm going to show you is very, how very simply you can take this and reconvert it to this. Okay, so you start with that data, you want to get that. Somebody gave you all those things. Now, this is a question, this is, by the way, a natural state of the world. Okay, suppose, and again, this is a, an example I'm going to show you. Uh, let me go, no, I don't have it, oh, here. So here is an, a, a real example. So this is a collection of 3,000 people, which is every column is one person. To each person, you ask a question, which is, uh, so there are 570 questions out here, okay? And you ask, you ask a question, I mean, I mean, do you like flowers, or uh, uh, do, you, do you hate your mother, or anything you want, right? And the person responds, yes or no, okay? Now, you think that the underlying model underneath it is that a, a given person would have a certain probability of answering yes to a certain question. Okay? And what you're seeing is having a coin toss. If the probability is 90% that he will answer yes, then most of the time he will say yes. But if he had a stomachache, he may say no, right? depending how he feels about it. So there is always a sort of stochastic aspect to that. So the, in other words, the data you collect is sort of a noisy, uh, a noisy representations of the underlying real probabilities of saying yes or no, okay? What you want is to get the, so for that population, I want it to be organized in such a way that <coughs> for each point, so I, I, for each point I actually have a probability field, and I also want to have a geometry here, so that this function, which is, if the, if the pixel is ij, right, if the location is ij, I want the function probability at ij to be as, as smooth as possible in my geometry. So I want, if I could, I would organize this like so, so that it's smooth in this direction and smooth in that direction, okay? Except, you know, the data, people don't have to be lying on a line, right? People are more complicated. It could be in, in a higher dimensional geometry, right? So my goal is to organize all the population in a demographic geography in way, and with some metric, which says two people are close to each other means that they are likely to answer the same, to have a similar probability field of responses. And then I want to also organize a question so that questions which are close to each other more or less ask the same thing, right? I mean, more or less, I mean, if you know the answer to one, you know the answer to the other. And the relation between questions should be that they basically measure, I think of questions as sensors. Right? You ask a question, you, it's a sensor. And I want to organize the sensors so that two sensors are close to each other if they most of the time measure the same thing. And I'll, I'll elaborate on that. So I want to organize the questions in such a way that I have a metric on the question, a metric on the, on the people, and I want the whole field to be smooth relative to those two metrics. Okay. And I will say what I mean by that more in, 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 in a few minutes, but I want to, to be able to predict, right? So suppose uh, that's really important. Wh why that? Once I've done this organization, so here I reorganize people into groups and questions into, into groups too, and you see what happens is this is pretty, a pretty clean picture which I formed out of that. This picture tells me everybody here is likely to answer, say, no, if black is no, and everybody here is likely to answer yes for, to all of those questions. And occasionally I have a black spot here or a white spot here, which I can view as, a, as an anomalous response, right? It's inconsistent with all the other responses which should be expected viewed based on other people which are similar to that person and other questions which are similar to that question. 
So I have a way of doing what we do in signal processing. If I wanted to clean up the image, well, I'll take a box like this and convert it to a barcode. So the version here would be a barcode, just a, a whole line is either black or white. Right? And, and so that would be cleaning up the database as if it were an image. right? And, but the, the other thing that it enables me to do is decide for any given question, is a person lying? Okay? Or is a person made a mistake or something? right? Because you can do that, and this would happen. So, by the way, this questionnaire is is a psychological questionnaire. We'll see it in great detail. And usually people who are interviewed for job interview uh, for the government or a criminal is going to prison, and they basically go through this questionnaire. And they, the purpose of the questionnaire is to decide whether they are fun dysfunctional or functional, whether they are prone to violence, to depression, and stuff like that. So if somebody is on a job interview is asked, uh, uh, do you have trouble getting to up in the morning? You know the answer. He's obviously not, right? And it doesn't matter, that it, but it could be completely inconsistent with all the other depression questions next to it. And so you, you know that, well, it's not truthful. So, so the point is that the goal is without knowing anything about anything, okay? Somebody gives you this matrix, okay? You want to get the demographic geometry of people or the psychological geometry of people the, uh, uh, as it's organized and you want to understand sort of a conceptual organization of the questions. I mean, do they deal with issues having to do with health or with social behavior or with other things like that? So that's if we go to a questionnaire. Let, let me return to where, where I was. So. This, so the object here was just, this is sort of an artificial ground truth kind of thing, right? The questionnaire was somebody gave us a string of this matrix and we had to figure it out. This was just for testing that we can actually recover the underlying probability field with some accuracy, okay? And that depends, of course, on the sampling. If you think about it, uh, the model that I have says, let's say I have uh, one person <coughs> is being asked repeatedly the same question 10 times, then obviously I count how many times this yes was being said and I know that I have an estimate of the probability. That doesn't happen here. No question is being repeated. Every question is being asked once. Nevertheless, you want to know the answer as if you, you knew every question was being asked a large number of times. Right. So there's a certain amount of that. Here is another questionnaire which is, uh, mathematical in, in, in nature, and which is this. Uh, every column is, so I have uh, 500 columns here, and I have 200 rows, okay? And I have the function sine kx, uh, x is in units uh, of, say, pi over 500, okay? And k uh, goes from one to 200. And this is my matrix, and then I permuted the rows and columns and I got this, right? So this is a very structured object, the sine kx, okay? The, all the rows are orthogonal to each other. So I can't tell anything. They're all at the same distance from each other. There's no row is any closer to any other row. I can't do anything. The, uh, on the other hand, I cheated. I took, f I took 500 columns, which means that if I take two columns, if I actually knew the x, x and, and the next one are not orthogonal, X and if I move two steps, they will be orthogonal, but X and the next one are not. So I can actually change the X, the, the columns in, in, a, on a, in a line by taking a column, taking the nearest neighbor, two nearest neighbors and then the two nearest neighbors. This will give me a chain and will give me a, ge a, a geometry on the columns. And from that geometry on the columns, I can actually uh, start to define a geometry on the rows in a way which I will describe in a minute, and that's in some sense the, the point of my talk, so that you can actually discover both k and x and their interrelations between them, which is sort of displayed in those curve, which is, uh, the curve is index indexing the, the x's and the other one is indexing the, maybe this is the x's, the other one is the, the, the k's. So, 
let me skip this. Let me, okay, so maybe I, sh I should tell you the way this is organized, okay? In fact, the, the way we organize the, the whole database that I gave you is extremely simple. We look at, the, bear in mind, I have no order, everything is in complete disorder, so I have to make some order in this mess. How do I make an order? I pick a column and I basically look at, at the nearest column to it, which is the one which agrees with it the most. If I'm asking a, a question in the psychological questionnaire, I say two people have similar profile. If they agreed on 90% of their question, they agreed. And then I link them, okay? And so that gives me a network of people, right, which is who are in agreement. This is a social network of the profiles of those people. So I had 3,000 people. Some of them uh, are, are linked because they agree 90% of the time and, the, and otherwise you don't link them, okay? So I get this network of people and I can rescale that. I re can organ define on this network a, a random walk, which is basically say, if a person has, is linked to say five, or five other people, then I define a walk set of transition from that person to the others uh, with probability five. So I, I have this, I, I build a graph based on this network and based on the strengths of the association between the profiles of two people. So I can organize, organize the, the people by, by their proximity in, in, in agreement, right? And I propagate this proximity in agreement by a random walk on uh, using that, that allows me to organize the, the population into groups. So I have, so let's say I want to organize the population into groups. I take a person, look at all the people who agree with that person 90% of the time, then take a person outside, look at all the ones that agree with him 90% of the time, take another and so on, until I can't do it anymore. And then I, all those center people are centers, and then I allocate to each one of them uh, the ones nearest to, with, with maximum agreement. So I have a, partitioned my population into groups of people such that within each group, people agree 90% of the time, okay? Then I can take those groups of people and pretend that each group of people like this is a, is a meta person and repeat the same thing, okay? So I take the group as, as a, and then I repeat, so I build, a hierarchy of people on it. Whenever you have a hierarchy, you, you can define distance between two people. So the distance is between two people would be the, the level, the, 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 the lowest level in the hierarchy that contains them. Okay, the size, the level, if at level one they're very close, at level two they're further away, at level four they're further away, and so on. So I, I can define, when I have a tree like this, I can define a metric so in any case, I've done that. So I group people in groups of profile similarity. Then I can group the questions by how they actually, uh, if I have two questions, I look across the population, how often they agree with each other. Okay, so if I strike 3,000 people, let's say they agree with each other 90% of the time, I connect the questions the same way. Okay, and I do exactly the same thing on the question. But for the questions, I can take people and meta people. If I have a question, I can look at is the response to that question on a group uh, similar uh, to each other. And I use the groups to augment the, the strengths, if you just like a filtering thing, augment the strengths of affinity between, between questions. And so once I have, that gives me a metric on the questions, and then I can go back to the people and use the groups of, the groups of questions are conceptual. Then I can use conceptual questions to organize the uh, to organize the the people better and go back and forth. I'll, I'll explain this in a minute in great detail. Okay, so this kind of iterative uh, learning you want to first of all you look at the people you do a little organize them a little bit now you know about groups of people and then you use that to organize the questions better by what the groups of people are doing. Let me give you another example of this kind. Suppose you have text documents, and you want to organize the documents so t by their vocabulary. So text documents, you have a document, you have a list, and again, you can have a list like this. You have a vocabulary of a thousand words, 
and which is sort of important words for this collection of documents. And then you say two documents are near each other if they have, if they have the same words, they have the same words in there. So basically each, for each word in each document, if the word is in the document, you put a one. If it's not, you put a zero. Same thing. You, you can do more fancy stuff, but that's good enough. Now you say take two documents that are similar to each other if they basically have the same vocabulary. Okay, if your vocabulary is rich enough, that's, that's a good thing. Think of the words as a collection of keywords, okay, not just all words. And so you can organize documents into topics, into groups of documents, which would, we will call topics. And then you can organize the words by how, how come, what are the co-occurrence of the words in the documents. So, and co-occurrence of the words in different topics. Okay. So co-occurrence in different topics works better. I will, t okay, so, th so that's, so you, you can do that. The, the problem is, is, is the following problem, that initially when you have two documents and you compare words, it may be that they don't have a single word in common, but they are really telling the same story. Because words, there are many words which are interchangeable, and it so happens that the author of this document liked this kind of those words and it didn't like those words. So if you just try to match the words, it doesn't work. On the other, on the other hand, if, you have the, if the words are, which have more or less the same meaning are in the same box or very close to each other, and now I want to compare one document to each other and I'm allowed to interchange words, then I have a good way of measuring things. Okay. So there is a metric called earth mover metric, which allows you to do that. By the way, this metric is the most common metric used in image retrieval, and we'll get to that. But you see, I'm describing it in a completely different setting because it's extremely natural. There are certain distortions which occur in nature, and this for documents is the sort of more or less stylistic use of words. And uh, we need to know what uh, what it is. So I, I just covered this thing. We need a, a in order to, to organize documents by content, you, we need to have a flexible vocabulary distance so that we, we are allowed to interchange words which, are, which measure more or less the same thing or are very strongly related. So what are metrics that do that? So there is a, a metric, so this is a, a I, I, I don't want to offend anybody, but this is a metric uh, now used uh, for the last 10, 10 of almost more than that, 15 years almost, uh, quite a bit in, uh, in issues of matching images and image retrieval. Uh, and it's, call, it's called the earth mover distance. It's an image in which, it's a metric in which you have some collection of probabilities in the case I had with documents, the probability was, could have been a probability of finding the word in a document. And I want to match two histograms, right? In documents, usually it's histograms of words. Uh, in this situation here, which you measure uh, radar reflections or something uh, in, in, uh, in this kind of polar coordinates, so you have, uh, you have uh, four uh, basically, you, you have 16 bins for each one of those three pictures. So you have those 16 bins. And the, your signature of this thing is basically how much energy you have in each one of the bins. And you want to measure the distance between those signatures. If you take the usual <coughs> naive distances, uh, you're in trouble. You see, if you take L1 distance between uh, this collection of numbers and this collection, uh, you see that the distance between A and B is 1, while the distance between B and C is less than 1, right? So this is closer to that than this is to that. With L2, uh, it's the same story, uh, but reversed. But do, or you do a chi-squared, it doesn't really matter. You cannot, you, you always make the wrong choice. On the other hand, if you allow yourself to move a little bit of the energy from a bin to a neighboring bin, paying a price, because you moved a little bit, right? So if I'm in B, and the little gray level in the, in the middle thing there is, <coughs> is this, no, is moved over to this, this lobe, and from that one to that one, 
it's a very low, short, pr small price. I'm just moving a little distance, one bin. There is a distance between the bins and a small amount of, of energy. And I find the distance between A and B is much smaller than the, than the other distances, which is exactly what you want to find. So the point is, if I want to match, for example, this hand to that hand, and, the, and they look like that, and I do a conventional distance, they're really far away. On the other hand, if I account for how much I, 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 I'm allowing to distort this into that, and I count how far I have to distort it, the cost of distortion is, is how much I have to move it, uh, then the distance is very small, right? And this is really what, what you need in order to, to, to say match objects that change or move. If I want to do video tracking or something, uh, then it's a correct distance, right? Because I know that object which has been, been mildly, di mi mildly distorted are, are like that. The problem is it's a complicated calculation. So if I formulate the problem as this, I have two probability distributions. And I want to measure the distance between them. And I measure it by doing a, a transport. So one is on x, the other one in y. I measure, I, I'm looking at the minimum of all possible transports of mass from x to y uh, with a cost function, which would be the distance between x and y or the distance to some power. And I want to minimize this transport over all possible ways of moving from x to y. So the transport equation is that they, you, you need to move everything uh, from, from all the mass of, uh, of one to the other. And you can write it this way. This is a, an optimization problem. And you know that when you have this kind of optimization, there is a dual problem. And you can compute this minimum by computing the, the supremum of the dual problem. The dual problem here, by luck, works is very nice. And, and that is what you need to do is maximize over all function f the, the integral uh, of f against p, where p is the, is the difference between the two objects. And the constraint on f is that f of x minus f of y is less than the distance between x and y. Uh, this condition is just saying that this is symmetric, so you can interchange. Just says that f has to satisfy a holder condition. The Lipschitz condition, if this is a distance, if this is a distance to some power less than 1, it's a holder condition. So this means that we, in order to compute that, that distance, you need to compute the, the norm of this function p as a, dual, as, a, as a linear functional on Lipschitz functions. Okay? Again, it's very easy to do. And I'll explain why it's very easy to do. It, it's actually faster than computing an ordinary distance. Okay. While, the, while this computation now is enormous. If I had 16 bins to do the optimization, it's 16 cube, 16 cube calculations. Usually when you have an image, you don't have 16 bins. You have millions of bins. And, and, and what I'm saying is you can do it in much less. Uh, let me give you uh, another example of that, uh, which is this one, and I'll return. So this example is, is the following thing. You have all those curves, which obviously are very close to each other. Okay? But if I measure their dis if I view each curve as, as, a, as, a, as a measure, so integration on the curve is, uh, ar ar by arc lengths is a measure, if I measure the distance between those measures, if each one has mass 1, uh, this measure is the distance between any two of them is, is equal to 2. Right? You have one and the other. They don't talk to each other. They're independent. But that's not the point. I mean, we know exactly what the distance is. If you look at it with, if you wear glasses, take them off, okay, <laughs> then they will look the same, right? So the point is that if I took each one of them and converted it, convolved it with a fat Gaussian of some f fat or just put a re drew a, a disk around it, I get a sausage. And then I compare the sausages, uh, their distance is small, right? If I blur it up, I will not see any difference between this curve and that curve. The other distance I could define is build a correspondence. Suppose I want the blue and the green. For each point on the green, I'll find the nearest point on the blue, and then that will give me the least cost of transport, and then integrate out all those distances. And that would be another way. I'm not sure this is the minimal thing, 
but uh, to find the transport from this curve to that curve is a complicated task. My point is you don't need to do that because what you could do is exactly the intuitive thing. You blur this, you blur that, take the L1 distance between them and uh, do it at different scales, weigh it by the size of the scale and you get the earth mover distance. It's completely equivalent, okay? So examples of to, to see this equivalence is, is the one I have here. This is tracking uh, with infrared camera a, a tank going across a, along a, 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 a trail at night. And so as it moves along, that's the kind of pictures you, you see. I mean, it's not great, right? It's far away. It's not great. And you want to track it. So you want to know that if you, you go at one time step, the next time step, the, the distance is not too big and so on. So this is just starting with a point where there, it's the same. There are three distances here. One is uh, using this averaging distance. The other one is a true deformation distance that I described. And you see they track each other. They're all the same. So you might as well do the cheapest. Okay, but you see the point. The point is things change. If you take an ordinary distance, the distance is always big. Okay, but if you take a distance which allows you to move things around or blur things a little bit, when you compare the blurred spots, you have a much better estimation of how close things are to each other. Uh, it's important for other reasons. So basically what I, if I want to say measure the distance between two images, uh, what I'm saying is so I have one image and another image. What we have seen is that the earth mover distance is this, the, the supremum. So think, normalize the image so that the mass is one. They have the same sum. And then take the soup over all function f satisfying the holder condition. Okay, and that gives you a computation of the earth mover distance. The theorem is you get that by taking, by taking this function here, convolving it with the Gaussian at different scales, and taking the sum <coughs> of the L1 norms that you get times the scale. And you take three scales, four scales. You get this quantity here. The, okay, now this is a theorem you may know if you know something about wavelets. Uh, because the Holder class in, in, in the wavelet basis is characterized by the fact that the wavelet coefficients are bounded by the scale to the alpha if you're doing Holder alpha. So the dual space is L1, and that's all I'm saying. Okay. So if you know that, fine. If you don't, I, I just gave you the intuition. Why, if I want to compare two curves, or to want to compare my two hands, which are not exactly the same, I'll just blur this one a little bit, this one, and you won't see the, dif the, the, the difference between the fingers anymore. And it, it would work just fine. Now, my point is that this is completely abstract. In the, in the case of the documents, I could compare one document to another and allow myself to, it, to exchange words, provided their distance, the cost of exchange is a distance in meaning, okay? So if I have two words with the same meaning, I can substitute, it doesn't cost me anything. But if they have slightly different meaning, I can still substitute it, but it'll cost me something. That allows me to take documents which have absolutely no words in common and find out that their distance is small because the words they have have almost the same meaning. Okay, so this is like the two curves, the several curves there. So the abstraction is, is really quite, uh, quite nice. So let me... All that, and let me return to this issue, and let's look a little bit about what happens when you take this psychological questionnaire and you build a geometry around it. Uh, in two minutes, I will go to images, uh, ordinary images, hyperspectral images, and various others. But still, I think the best intuition is here. <coughs> it's, it's very di difficult to think of an image as a questionnaire. Okay, every pixel is a person, and the features around that pixels are the questions you ask the pixel. Okay, and then we will organize a picture as a questionnaire, and we will get segmentation of the image, segmentation of the features, and so on. Uh, we'll, we'll do that in a minute. But let me <coughs> stick to people because it's, uh, <coughs> it's a little more fun. So when I take <coughs> those 3,000 people and I build this uh, sort of diffusion process 
on the, pop on the, on the people by basically, uh, I'm allowed to jump from one person to the next if they are close to each other uh, with probability corresponding to how close they are to each other. That, <coughs> that Markov matrix that you build <coughs> has eigenvectors and after you've run re the questionnaires, you can represent every point in terms of the uh, values of, say, the, the first three non-trivial eigenvectors in there. You get a surface like that. Okay? I'll show you the surface and the meaning in a second. This is a group of people. So here I pick, picked a group of people who are very similar in profile in this region. The distance here in this pic three-dimensional picture of the surface is the Euclidean distance represent the, the similarity of profile. I mean, you can use the Euclidean difference co to compute similarity of profile. We find that all the people out here have, are extremely dysfunctional, okay? What the psychologists gave us is they told us for each person, so this is data that we didn't have. It's just data to show that we are functional, okay? In other words, that this works, okay? And <clears throat> so there are different scores. Psychologists, this is a depression score. And the scale here is zero is a mean depression score for all the population. Uh, one is one standard deviation up. This is one standard deviation down. And all of those people have severe psychological problems. Okay? Not, not all of them are severe, but they all have issues. <coughs> the other group on the other side of the spectrum, so I was here before is exactly the opposite. Those people are extremely functional. Uh, depression score is way low, okay? They're always excited and in good, good mood. Uh, and then the other, all the scores are good, okay? And so you see that this map here, and, and in fact, it is true, each one of those, so this is a, a psychological profile of the population, okay? Dysfunctional is here. I'm sorry, dysfunctional is out here. Functional is here. The different, uh, the regions of interest are really here, okay? If somebody is really tr in trouble, you know this immediately. Uh, <coughs> if not, uh, so the issue here, to find out that you belong to here, you just have to ask five questions. Here you have to do quite a bit. By the way, th this questionnaire is, is administered in the millions. Uh, <coughs> okay, so the, the group we have just seen, this group here, I can place it on my, uh, I can build a partition tree, which is the one I was describing, in which the population is broken into two big groups. So this is functional and dysfunctional, okay? And this particular subgroup is, is down here, right? So this uh, functional was broken into this one, which is a little bit less functional, more functional, and then every group, every point on this tree describes a subgroup of the population. This tree defines all kinds of other things uh, that you may be familiar with. One is, it's of course a partition tree. It defines a metric, the distance between, say, this and that, between a point in here and a point in here, is, is exactly uh, two to the number of level between here and there, okay? And so the distance here is, point here and here is very far. And two points here is not so far. If you go back further down, it's smaller. So this is a metric. It's an artificial metric in some sense. You don't trust it completely because the tree is an artificial tree. But you, if you average it on many trees, you're, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a perfectly okay metric. And one can, uh, and there's very nice theorems to show that, but that's not the point. The point is, I've now organized the population. <coughs> Let's see what happened to the question. Just like since well, there was complete symmetry between people in question. So the, 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 the questions themselves are organized in a surface like this, which you will see because I'll turn it around in a minute. But there are groups of questions. So here, this group of questions here uh, is the following. I find it hard to keep my mind on a task or job. I'm, I'm certainly lacking in self-confidence. I have difficulty in starting to do things, even when I'm uh, with people I feel lonely much of the time. I've several times given up doing things because I thought too little of my ability. You see the point, okay? Now, the issue is, that one, I never read the questions, 
Okay, I didn't know what the questions are. We had a matrix of zero ones. Okay, and the questions were organized this way, and the people were organized the other way. We didn't know anything. Okay, this is just validations that we are not just messing around, right? I mean, this thing, and and so you see that the questions are organized into conceptual groups, and the people are organized into contextual group, in the sense that they have similar profiles, and in 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 uh, one relative to the other. So. We are basically saying if a if, if certain group of questions have certain behavior, the same thing is, is true for the other. Here is another group of questions. So we just turn it, turn it a little bit. So you see the surface does this, turns around, and comes back down here. Okay. So this is another group of questions. So uh, I'm almost never bothered by pains of, over my heart or in my chest. I hardly ever feel pain in the back of my neck. I have very few quarrels with members of my family. You see they go together. I have little or no trouble with my muscles twitching or jumping. I do not notice my ears ringing or buzzing. Anyway, it's okay. Okay. So, so those are well-being questions. The other one have to do. We're more of a mood type, and self-confidence issues. And and again, they're they're pop, popping out. So they could be. Now the distance here is meaningful. Okay. So this picture, is is real knowledge. Okay. Two points which are far away are questions which are unrelated. If they are close to each other, they're unrelated. They're in the same topic. Okay? So the questions are conceptually the same if they're in a small group here. In this geometry. So I started with your non-Euclidean geometry. The geometry was just nothing. Right? There was no geometry. I found the geometry. Now, you can, if I didn't have the outside information, I could still get something useful. If I look at the group of questions I had a minute ago about well-being, okay, I find, and, and I look at the different population groups, it tells me what the response to this group of questions is in the different population groups. So this population group said no most of the time, and that one, uh, the one over there said yes most of the time, and that's in between to that, uh, to that thing. And you can view this as, as basically an estimate of the probability for this group of saying yes, right? If you just move it up to be positive, that's exactly what it does. So, add one and divide by two, you get the probability attached to resp to the number of yeses in that particular group. Okay, so let me just say one thing here. What when we do this kind of thing? And the initial data matrix was a data matrix M of X. So think of every point as an XY point, or IJ if you wish. If the initial data matrix uh, was given like this, after the reorganization and so on, you, can, uh, you are organizing it so that it becomes predictable. In other words, what it means is that if you look at four points, you can actually estimate this value from the other three values with an estimate which is the product of the distances between the, the, the horizontal distance and the vertical distance. This is like a Taylor expansion. So I'm saying if I want to estimate what the response is at x1, y1, it is equal to the response at a nearby point in, in y0 plus the derivative at some other point in the y1 thing, and I get an error, and the error is like a product. So it's a much, it's a, it gives quite a bit of precision in estimating what you expect to get at a given entry based on what you have around it. And so you can actually uh, decide whether a point is an anomaly or not and so on. So let me skip all of that and let me show you some other examples. So here is another questionnaire. This one is an image. A pixel is a person. The questions you ask the pixel here are very simple. You take a 11 by 11 square centered at the pixel, take the Fourier transform of that. You can take the log of the, Fourier tra of, the, of the absolute value of the Fourier transform if you wish, and that's your response. So you have 121 questions, okay, which are the Fourier coefficients of this patch around the point. Okay. And those are the questions you ask. 
So your question there is if I have a certain number of pixels here, those are my people, every person is asked 121 questions. And then you do what I just did. Okay, so what you have is you have a tree of people, which are pixels, and a tree of questions, which are frequency, frequency uh, responses, okay? And when you do that, uh, you find out that if you go at the top, so you split, the first level is one, then you split in two, you get this and that picture. Then you go one level below that, uh, you, you get a little bit finer, you identify those uh, green points here, which correspond to this, which belong to here, this would correspond to, to this thing here, which looks more like that than like this, okay? And, and then you have the boundary uh, region here, which is a little bit of each, right? So this is another set. So, so you basically, you get the tree corresponds, of the, the people tree corresponds to a segmentation of pixels, right? And then you have also have a segmentation uh, of, of the, of the uh, frequencies, which I'm not displaying here. Okay, so here is another questionnaire on, on questions, uh, on, on pictures, okay? This is, this questionnaire, so where, what are the questions? It's a collection of filter banks, okay? Uh, which means that you're taking the image and you are, you're taking its Fourier transform and in the Fourier domain, you multiply by, say, a, a Bell function, which is like the characteristic function of that. You restrict the Fourier coefficient to a box to one of those boxes, and you come back. Okay? You get a filtered version of the picture. Now, if you filter here, you're basically looking at oscillations in this direction at that frequency. Okay? If you're looking here, the frequency is higher, and uh, the direction is more precise. Right? And so those are, uh, they correspond more or less to the visual cortex uh, elements or to curvelets, if you wish. They're not wavelets, they're curvelets, because the higher the frequency, the more I have directional resolution. Okay, if I go up here, I have more and more. And now you take the zebra and you do the partition tree. The way I've described it, you, you get this kind of thing. I'm not saying this is good or bad or anything. I'm just telling you that you can interrogate the question and you can ask yourself, what happens, right, for a given filter, what do I see in the picture? Uh, if I want to do a segmentation, which are the filters that allow me to find the body as opposed to the boundary of the zebra? And I can actually isolate that out. I can characterize, for example, the characteristics of the, of the background, which is the, the, so the complement here, and uh, and then uh, do all kind of statistical analysis or other things. By the way, those features have nothing to do. I, I picked them because this is sort of natural for some problems. In reality, you could do other things. You could take, uh, for each pixel here, you could take a patch. You can ask what is the histogram of the, of the pixel values in that. Then look at all patches nearby. You have a collection of histograms. You could do a principal components on that. And that tells you something about the statistics of the statistics and the variability. And use that as a questionnaire. So the covariance matrix of those things could be your, your, your list of questions. And then you can organize everything that way. So what your question now depends on your goal, but that's something we always knew. And so if you want to identify, say, a target uh, which is characterized by different statistics, then you ask those statistical questions. If the features are sort of periodic or textural features of that kind, you ask this kind of question. And then, so what you do with it, it allows you to decide which questions are reasonable, which are not. So I processed the matrix, right? So I had the data matrix. Now my point is, those data matrices are arriving everywhere in nature. So for example, this is an acoustic uh, uh, Green's function which means that if I have an acoustic charge at point Y, at different point Xs, I'm going to, to, to get this response. So what is my questionnaire here? My questionnaire here, I have, I have a charge here. I'm going to sit on various points on the curve here, and I want to know what am I going to hear, okay? And if, my, if I have my charge, if, I have a ch if Y is here and X is here, 
what I hear depends very much on the direction of the normal vector of the vector that if I take the chord, take the normal vector, the angles between them will tell you what part of the signal that I had here I'm going to hear to, to see here. So the issue is that this matrix is a questionnaire. I have a point Y which is a source, a point X which is a receiver. I'm emit I'm sort of pinging the, at the source. I get stuff at the receiver. And my, my, inter, my physical matrix is a question. I'm questioning every source and so on. And this is a really complicated questionnaire, much more so than many of the others uh, we have had. And, uh, and the question is, how do you organize this transition uh, uh, matrix? If I didn't have oscillation here, as this is something well known, what I've done would have worked very nicely and I would get what is called the fast multiple realization of my matrix by doing this questionnaire thing. Okay, so this is classical fast numerical analysis in certain situations. In the case that I have oscillation here, you need to do a little bit more than what I said. You discover something called geometric optics out of this process, which is purely automatic. Okay, that's the whole point. I don't need to know what the curve is. I just need to collect interaction. Okay, or basically have a list of interaction between them. So, so the goal of my exercise, so this is the actual, once you process the thing and organize it, you get a much simpler thing, but it's much more complicated than what I said. If you have a good, just potential charges, it's very easy. So you have a kernel like this and you do that. It's very, very simple. It works quite nicely. Okay, I think my time is up. Uh, if you're interested, I have the software that ran on the psychological questionnaire. I can run it on hyperspectral imagery or anything you want and you get this segmentation and organization and you can do use it for detection, anomaly detection and stuff like that. Very, very nicely. But so my, my point is, I, at least my goal in this thing in, in the past was to take uh, data and develop tools that actually enable you to discover what kind of analysis you need to do on them and what kind of geometries, what kind of groupings, what kind of interactions occur. And this process is a, is a good beginning. Uh, I, I still don't know how to do it with the highly oscillatory thing, but we'll get there next time. I, I say, yeah, so let me ask you, what kind of imitation you want? What, what was the problem? Texture segmentation. Texture segmentation. Yes, that's exactly what you want to do. So, so it's exactly what you want to do. The best right, right. So what's happening, is it's exactly that. So you can take a bigger library than what I have. Okay, you can take all possible rectangular uh, filters. I mean, polar, rectang polar filters. Here I chose a subset, right? And then you can ask yourself, in a given uh, image, right, what are the filters that actually see something in the image? That you can actually characterize them by, 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 the, the, the by their histogram, by histogram of the pixel after you filtered. If it looks like a Gaussian around zero, throw it away, okay? On the other hand, if it's, you, you always will get a Gaussian around zero in the histogram, but you also have some bumps. If you took the, the size of that bump tells you if the, if the filter sees something in there. That subselects for you filters that see something in the image. Then you could try and be, uh, okay, so that tells you who you, what are the questions to ask. If you don't see anything, there's nothing to ask. Okay, and then you can run it just like that. And usually what happens is if you have different textures, like in the rug situation, the, the features for one piece are quite different than the features for the other fees. And if you organize the features into sort of meta features, which are groups of features, uh, you may want to, to restrict them to one texture. Those are, the, those are the, the features for that texture. And I have a different language for that one. 
It's like with vocabulary, if I use a word uh, cell, right, I have to, I, I shouldn't be using it if I have biology and, and chemistry saying or electrochemical sayings, right? There's, this cell means something different from that. And there, there's confusion, but once I restrict to one or the other, it's good. Okay, so you have to contextualize always. In other words, there's, there's no general answer. It always has to depend on context. So this is an attempt to define context and concept, and then on the first la run, and then you're, you're, you're in the psychological situation, there are the functional people, dysfunctional people. What I do with functional people should be different than dysfunctional people. Functional people are easy, and we know the answer. And if the answer is, is different, then you know something. With dysfunctional, some of the questions are all over the place. You don't want to. 